Hey, kids, it's still the Drive School Podcast. I am still Pastor Goodman, and uh, Pastor Brad Meyer is, is still with us. How you doing? I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing that I'm still here, but I am still here. It's a good thing because last time we, we poked a bear, we, we asked one of those really, really important questions, and we only like did wrong answers so far. Uh, we, we said, why do bad things happen? And we sort of left the reality of, of well, we know that you know, bad things happen because of sin, but that's no comfort to anybody who happens to be sinned against or even just a sinner. Uh, and we also recognize that like some bad things you can't pray away or believe away or, or, or fix by your own power. And you, you, you left us with just a little bit of hope before we, we left. And I want to, I want to get the rest of that out. Sometimes you said, sometimes the, the only thing you can do is, is grab hold of the cross and shake it until the gospel falls out. Well, <laughs> what, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, it means you need to start going to the gym and getting buff, right? It, it takes a uh, lot of a lot you're of right back to my own to, works that I'm not very good at. That's right, fantastic. You, know, you got to be jacked to lift a cross, you know. <laughs> <laughs> at least if it's any sizable one. No, in, that's in how they tend to portray the Lord. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, hit the protein. <laughs> Anyways, uh, in all seriousness, goodness. though, in all seriousness, you know, I think of um, just this last Sunday, I got to preach on Genesis 32. Um, Jacob wrestling God. And uh, this is a passage, I think, that illustrates the point I was Mm -hmm. trying to make. So, you know, to make a long story short, Jacob wrestles with God and he prevails against God is what the text says. And uh, he holds on to God and won't let go until God blesses him. And there's all kinds of weird things in that passage, like who the heck just starts randomly wrestling a guy that just shows up in the middle of the night. That's, that's a little weird, you know? And, and at the end of it too, there's the whole thing about not eating meat that's on the sinew of the thigh. And anyways, there's a lot of strange stuff. It's all kind of a surreal thing, but Mm -hmm. for our purposes, I think the thing we want to focus on is that Jacob grabs onto God and he doesn't let go until God blesses him. And he holds onto God and demands a blessing and refuses to let go until that happens. And I think this is the example for us in the midst of hardship and tragedy. Because remember, the context here is Jacob is afraid of his brother Esau and what he might do. Mm -hmm. Esau's trying to kill him because he deserves it. Like, this is the thing you kind of get to to talk about is that he he deserves it. Well, absolutely, he deserves it. I mean, he stole his birthright. He stole the blessing of his father. And then he disappeared for, what, 21 years, something like Mm -hmm. that? And comes back with uh, two wives and a couple concubines and a whole bunch of sheep and some kids. And mm-hmm. then the realization, it seems like en route that, oh, no, hey, my brother might be mad at me. And so it's my up. actions have consequences. <laughs> this is weird. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part of that story, by the way, is not only does he try to bribe Esau and send all those gifts on mm-hmm. when he finds out that Esau is coming with 400 men because his little bribery messengers come back. He sends his entire family across the Jabbok to put them in between him and his brother. Uh, you know, this is a stand up stand up guy here. This is great. So, <laughs> this is actually a really good place to talk about it though, because the the person who wrestles with God is not sort of the person who just had the perfect faith and and did all the right things and then prayed real hard. Uh it, it's it's something else entirely, which which actually is the thing we need to talk about when bad things are happening. Because you set up a stage, I think unintentionally in Christianity a, a lot of times where you leave the only people who are capable of receiving help as the ones who don't actually need it anymore. Um, And if you're actually having the why do bad things happen conversation, it's probably not hypothetical. You've you've got something specific in mind. Well, you know, whether they want to share it with you or not, they do. I mean, everybody has something specific. And if you don't, you will. This is the nature of life. You will have bad things either happen to you or someone you care about. That's just the way the world works. And we can talk about all the, you know, theological reasons why that is the case. We can talk about practical cause and effect sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it is simply true that this is the world we live in. And consequently, people are going to sit there and wonder, why? Why is it this way? Why does God allow this to happen? How come me and not somebody else? Uh, And so on and so forth. You know, think of poor Job. Job insists over and over and over again, hey, look, I am righteous. I've done nothing wrong. I trust the Lord. I do what he tells me to do. How come you, you you know, yutzes haven't had anything happen to you, right? How come you guys aren't suffering like me? And I've done better than you, you know, and these are the kinds of questions people ask and they're not bad questions. I I mean, they're really not because it is unfair the way the world Mm -hmm. works sometimes. And so what do we do about it? Well, when we wrestle God, I, I don't know anyone that's had a God show up in the middle of the night and just start like tackle him out of bed and start wrestling with him. Um, usually when we wrestle with God, it's more of the mental and spiritual sort, you know, the, the sleepless night sort of thing. 
Right. And uh, that's the realm that we have our wrestling in. And typically it takes the form of questions, what ifs, regrets, um, struggles, not knowing, being confused, um, wondering if God's actually going to do what he says or if his promises are really real or if he's even there at all. These are the kinds of things we wrestle with. Right, because what we have to sort of go on, we we have our we have our reality, and we have the way that we feel about it. And so, if if I feel guilty because I have sinned, and you tell me I've, I am forgiven, the question that I want to go to before is it true? Is do I still feel guilty? And you know, I, I can say that I have a God who loves me and cares for me in all my needs of body and soul. But when I am still hungry or hurt or sick at the end of the day, it's hard to to stop and say, is this promise true? Rather than can I look around and am I still sick? Um, and, and sort of put that first to say, none of the other things outside of this one moment can be true because of, of my personal experiences inside of it. And, and that's, that's incredibly dangerous for a lot of reasons. It's called enthusiasm. It's real, real bad. But um, it, it's, it's one of those chief places where we are forced to, well, where God is forced to wrestle with us. I, I actually like this story because God comes and picks the fight. He, he doesn't <laughs> wait, you know? Well, it's, it's, it's important. Go ahead. I got you no, right when you were drinking. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I got a little bit of a scratchy throat, so I got some honey tea here. Um, but no, you're right. God comes and, and picks the fight and wrestles. But the thing that I like about Jacob is he just will not let go. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he just holds on and he demands a blessing and a promise. It seems that he figures out in the midst of the contest, he's wrestling with God. You know, he, he, he knows this by the end of it, clearly. You know, he says, oh, oh I shall call this place Peniel because I've seen God face to face and I didn't die. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's pretty amazing. Got that um, going for me. And so, you know, what is the example that, that Jacob gives us? Well, the example is cling to God, hold on tight and demand the blessing. Mm-hmm. And I know that this is the problem. Okay, so Lutherans out there and, and whoever else might be listening to this, um, you know, we have this thing in our piety that it's inappropriate of us to take things to God. Like, I'm not allowed to tell him that I'm suffering I'm or that I'm mad about something or that I have really confused and upset about the way things are working out. And I, I God, why did you not do that? I can't talk about that. So what do we do? We bury it, we repress it, or we just walk away from the church and from Christ. That's what we do. Yeah. And the example of, of the Old Testament over and over and over again is that you're supposed to then turn around to God and say, no, hold on a minute, mister. You promised that it would not be this way, and it is this way. So what the heck? Where's mm-hmm. the promise? Where's the blessing? And you grab on tight, and you do not let go until you have a blessing. That is the disposition of faith. It doesn't require that we have all the answers or everything figured out. And I know some people are going to think that's a bit of a cop-out. But it does mean that we know enough to know where the blessings and the promise come from, which is from God. And of course, God will give what he's promised. He's done that over and over and over again. Knowing the history of God's people is seeing fulfilled promises all over the place. I mean, read through the book Exodus sometime. God promised he would deliver his people. And what did he do? He delivered them. And then he delivered them. And then he gave them signs. And then he fed them. And then he delivered them some more. And I mean, how do you doubt that God's going to do what he said when he's done so over and over and over again? So when things don't appear to be working out or God's promises seem distant or even God himself seems distant, the thing that we ought to do as Christians is grab hold of God through his word, cling tight. And as I kind of said last time, shake it until the promises fall out, right? You start Mm -hmm. seeing that gospel for you. There's a lot of cool stuff in there when you do that too, because not only do you have a God who continues to promise and then answer his promises, uh, you also have sort of the people in the midst of it, which helps because first you get to start to see that it's never according to sort of the way that they would do it in their timing or their patience, but also you get to see over and over again how many people uh, who have their prayers perfectly answered still find a way to be utterly discontent. You you mentioned um, Moses leading Egypt, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt and how many times they whined in the desert about being you know so hungry. It would be better if we were back in Egypt, at least there, there was food. The thing you gave me exactly what I needed, exactly what you promised, exactly what you gave, I, I still have discontent with. And then you get to start to see maybe like the, the discontent is the problem. And, and that's the thing to also bring to God. Well, we all like to worship the God of the stomach and human desire. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's a hard thing to overcome. <laughs> sometimes we call him mammon. Sometimes we call him the passions of the flesh. Sometimes we just call him hungry. <laughs> Anyways, the chocolate cake God is not a God worth serving. He's always going to leave you wanting more, Mm. more food, more indulgence. It doesn't work out. You know, um, in Bible study this morning, we're working through Job on my weekday Bible study here. And uh, Mm -hmm. 
it, the book gets kind of repetitious after a while because all of Job's friends make the same points and Job has the same response pretty much every time. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that's interesting that we talked about this morning is that you really have two options in life. I mean, it, it, this is a lot of people think this kind of stuff's an oversimplification, but quite honestly, you have two options. Option A is you build your life on the ro- good rock, the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, or you don't. Mm-hmm. That's it. Those are your two options. And when the storms come, the tornadoes come, the floods come, whatever comes, something's going to come and it knocks over what you built. Well, either you're going to have everything swept away and you're going to be left in a giant puddle of mud, or it'll be swept away and you're still standing on the solid rock, which will allow you to you know, rebuild from the ground up. Those are your well, two options. Also, it'll also take away everything that you, you want to call God that isn't. And, and there you, you hate it and it has to be sort of wrestled into you. Um, but it's a gift. It, it, it's a gift when God takes away our idols because I will, I will eat all of the chocolate cake and feel <laughs> awful the whole rest of the day. Uh, somebody needs to take that away from me. That's what children are for. <laughs> so, so I, I think maybe the other place to sort of talk about this is um is is the comfort level with suffering um why do bad things happen and like me personally i'm not super comfortable with suffering uh but i think based on the symbol of our religion our god might be yeah he he's a lot more comfortable with suffering than we are um, you know, we don't like people who are like suffering. They're they're sadists and masochists, right? We have words for those people, and they're not good words. Mm-hmm. But God seems to be okay with suffering, and it's not because He's you know morbid and He likes to see us all miserable. It's because suffering is one of the ways that He actually helps us keep our eyes on the prize, as it were, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, I don't know if you've ever had something tragic happen to you. It suddenly makes things have a clear perspective that it didn't before. So you lose a loved one that's close to you. Um, all of a sudden, these things that you were spending all your energy on, things that you're wasting your time with, the things you thought were important or that really mattered, it turns out none of that stuff mattered. What really mattered was spending time with your loved one. Well, the same thing is true with, with idols. We think these gods that we follow and worship are worth our time, whether it's money or even family or you know the nation or whatever it is. Um, there may be good things, but the fact of the matter is, is they don't have eternal consequences, except in the negative. And so when God comes and takes those away from us through suffering or hardship, it's not ultimately a bad thing. It's it's actually there, even there, a, a gift. Um, it, it's it's again sort of that right now moment versus the bigger picture, though, because the the problem I have with suffering is that it hurts and that that's a right now thing. But then you go to like, and, and you can be cute and coy with it all you want, like I, how much I hate to exercise because it hurts, but I I do it because I it's good for me. It, it, it helps me not die of a heart attack as I am want to do based on my genetics. And it might help me be there for my kids a little bit longer. And so I go out and exercise. I hate the suffering, but I get to look at the outside of the picture right now kind of thing. Um, the, the same thing here is, is then true. Uh, whenever we sort of stumble into this suffering that, that we don't like, uh, because it, it hurts right now, uh, the cross of Christ, it, it lets us look to a larger picture. It lets us look sort of beyond the right now to the, what is, is the purpose of this? And I can say sometimes I have no idea why I'm suffering. And it's not yours to figure out why, even if you knew why it would still hurt, you'd still hate it, you still wouldn't like it. The question is sort of, is God working good here or not? And there you can't go to your suffering. You have to go to his but he promises to join your suffering to his suffering and and there use it in in well his way well that's i think one of the things that's easy to overlook you will suffer that's life i'm sorry mm-hmm. i i don't like it either but that is the case and so the question then becomes what is the purpose of suffering is our suffering pointless does our suffering just simply hurt us and then someday we die Or has our suffering itself been redeemed in Christ and now serves God's purposes? And even if we don't always see the clear answer to that presently, we will someday. You know, as Paul Mm. says, presently I see through the mirror darkly, but then I shall know face to face. Well, this is what the promise is. And uh, again, you know, I... I I know it's an oversimplification, but it's also true (laughs) that either we have a life built in Christ on his solid promise, on his solid work, or we don't. And that's it. One of these things has eternal consequences. It leads to forgiveness, life, and salvation that lasts forever. The other one does not. And and that's just the way it is. And either way, we're going to suffer. Either way, we're going to have tragedy and bad things. But one of these things promises us at the end of the day, those things don't win. The other one can't make any guarantees about any of that. In fact, it's likely that those things are the last word. You get to go to the grave and 
that's it. So the the kind of the beautiful part about the the simplicity of it is that it is utterly without excuse. Like the reason that all of our other explanations or justifications for suffering are are so complex is because we're trying to excuse it away somehow. And, and you just cut right to the quick of it. Jesus loves you by suffering for you on the cross, and mm -hmm. it's going to hurt you too. But you will be joined through death and back out into eternal life. It's it's an answer that's honest. Well, it's that beautiful passage that we read out of the LSB at funerals, Romans 6, right? Mm. You've been baptized, joined, to, uh, joined by baptism into the death of Christ so that you will have a resurrection like his. And there's the promise. It is not apart from suffering and death that we earn salvation and forgiveness in life. It's through it. And just as our Lord to, went to the cross and suffered and died for our sake, he bids us follow him. So we do, which unfortunately means that this world and the devil and even our own sinful hearts are going to cause us some pain and suffering and anguish in the meantime, but we will endure. We will make it through. You know, God has provided no temptation that there isn't a way out of. Sometimes that way out is death, but mm -hmm. there is a way out. And at the end of the day, Christ is Lord of all things, death and life. And he uses all things for his good for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right. And, and that, that lets us change the question that got us started on this. Why, why do bad things happen? And they're just, that's the wrong question. Like full stop. You're not asking a helpful question. So you're not going to get a helpful answer. Instead of asking, why do bad things happen? Ask, who is your God? And, mm -hmm. and from there, the, the, the why is not only answered, but it's answered with hope. So who, who is your God? Yours is the God of the cross and the empty tomb. So, so hang on to that. Amen. Pastor, thanks so much. Hey, thanks for having me.